And so for working group three, we have Simone um, Pinero. I'm not doing good with any last names today. <laughs> who's, who's joining us from the US Food and Drug Administration presenting on behalf of the working group that was led by her and Bob Davis from the University of Tennessee Health Science Center. So good evening. I'll, I'll try. To, we had uh, very interesting discussions last evening, and I, uh, Bob and I sort of uh, wrote down what we thought would be the key points or the, the key take-home messages from these discussions. But if I'm in any way not representing them well, or if I'm not capturing everything um, that was discussed, I'll ask that the group members feel, feel free to chime in. And these were the, the group members. So we're tasked with several questions, and one of them were to identify key gaps in pharmacosurveillance. And by far the main challenge that we discussed were difficulties in case ascertainment or identification of the phenotype. We thought that we needed, in order to achieve that, we would need standard case definitions. Uh, it would be helpful to have a minimum set of variables that could differentiate well cases from non-cases. And it would be helpful to have that to be generalizable to common data models so we can use large data. And at the end of the day, we need the ability to dig deeper. We need to be able to validate uh, the, these cases. We need to be able to, to figure out um, a timing of, of the exposure to try an attempt to, to establish causality uh, between the, the exposure of, of the potential exposure of, of um, a causative exposure and, and, and the case. So some next steps that we uh, discussed uh, in regards to that particular topic were uh, to evaluate different case definitions that are currently being used by other groups. Uh, some examples are listed there, EROSCAR, Registar, itch and other SJS projects. And at the end of the day, this is going to be an iterative process among researchers and clinicians to arrive at a common definition. But that if we can do that, that would be extremely helpful. Um, the bottom line is that active surveillance with real-time data collection is very different from retrospective collected data with case validation and a set of items that could satisfy both collection efforts would be very helpful. We also talked about capabilities of developing active monitoring in the United States specifically. And, um, and there are several challenges. Uh, one of them is the fact that our healthcare system is very fragmented. But at the end of the day, we may need multiple strategies that include use of both prospective and retrospective data collection. For prospective data collection efforts, um, we would need here allow us to have more complete case ascertainment uh, for pharmacogenomic studies. And we discussed a lot, um, uh, perhaps the use of burn units. Uh, and it seems to be a promising approach since that's where uh, many of these patients uh, end up being cared for. Uh, and perhaps focusing on a few large areas or cities in the United States may be helpful, given the difficulties of, of uh, doing this nationally. Of course, that's the ideal. Um, use of existing large databases for active surveillance um, can be promising because of the, the large numbers. Um, however, there's still several things that need to be um, accomplished in order for us to get there. Uh, some capabilities are being developed in some databases for pharmacogenomic studies, but we need uh, the ability to identify cases reliably uh, and the ability to conduct case validation, blinded, of course, to exposure status. We need standardized processes for collecting genetic data across disparate sites and so on. And eMERGE, as we heard yesterday, has, has had <coughs> success in shepherding uh, this process. <clears throat> we also talked about uh, challenges in estimating rates of SJS and TEN, uh, and that's also uh, an, uh, an issue of particular importance here for the, the, the U.S. <clears throat> but a lot of the discussions here, and I'm curious to hear <clears throat> also from other uh, in, the, in, this, in this room, uh, one of the, the, the issues that we discussed is whether this is truly a priority whether we need to understand rates. And of course, for our, 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 uh, an event as rare as SJS and 10, trends may not, over time, may not be that helpful. But uh, this is probably very relevant for cost-effectiveness study to estimate burden of disease and to calculate product-specific rates. <clears throat> and if we need to, to do so, of course, near a complete capture of cases and ability to identify them and enumerate a population is, is needed. Uh, <clears throat> 
And uh, if we can develop this capability, we can consider assessing product product specific rates, perhaps race specific rates, which um, may be very helpful and informative to us. And as we consider that, it's, it would be important, of course, to restrict um, this type of, of study to um, new users of a drug, since if you include prevalent users of a drug, uh, these people may no longer be at risk for SJS and, or TN if you've been using a drug for years. Uh, we also talked about gaps in knowledge in terms of uh, understanding disease progression and um, uh, and also gaps in knowledge in terms of understanding long-term outcomes of, of uh, SJS and TN. Some, some, some uh, strategies that we uh, discussed was to consider use of SCORE 10, which is uh, used in Europe as a mostly a seven-point score used for prognosis calculated on day three of the disease. Uh, but some of the limitations is that data are not always collected on day three, such as, for example, lab values, and some characteristics, such as lung involvement, may not be con are not considered in, in score 10. Uh, now the next steps to consider uh, studies to address the range and extent of outcomes and disabilities in these patients. And there's also another of um, um, loose items that we discussed yesterday that we thought that would be important to bring up. Um, Large-scale collaborations in the U.S. might be stimulated by concerted efforts to deposit data into public databases, and some of them uh, discussed was uh, databases such as ClinVar and others. And we also talked about the challenges with current screening recommendations because of the low PPV of, of these, meaning not everyone that, that screens positive would, like, would actually um, go on to develop the disease. So if we could come up with ways to improving that, perhaps talking about if you have a haplotype plus a series of risk factors uh, in order to increase, increase the, the um, predicted value of these screening tests may be helpful as well. So this is all I have, and I'll open for the group members in case if we forgot uh, anything important or was not accurate enough, of course. Lois. Um, we also discussed a network such as Dylan. Remember, that was at the end. I don't think you mentioned that. You probably mentioned networks in general. But at, we thought the group thought it would be useful. And some members didn't know about Dylan or, or how it was formed. So they were looking forward this morning to Jay Hufnagel's talk. So I think we are more informed now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, Maya. Maya. Um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, mention when we talked about um, the clinical classification, there was not an issue that the clinical classifications are no good. They are very good for prospective cases. The difficulty that we identified was um, when we thought there's a um, retrospective setting, how could you first have inclusion criteria to identify potential cases and how could you validate them? Because if you are as strict as with um, cases that you have everything available prospectively from photographs to biopsy to everything, um, it's not such a difficulty. I mean, sometimes it's challenging in individual cases, but in principle, the setting is there. But for retrospective cases, it can be quite complicated. And that was one thing. And the other thing was um, trying to make a link between retrospective data assessment and potential um, uh, genetic investigation or genomics, you know, how could you have access to the blood of patients if you have the data retrospectively? Are there any means uh, or not? Certainly not for the cells because you need them in the acute stage, but perhaps for DNA. And we also thought maybe there can be a question whether um, um, the patient associations could help um, to donate blood. We have done that in France and we had about 70 cases, but we went back to the case charts, um, reviewed everything, um, and then could include these cases for uh, genetic studies because the patients donated uh, uh, samples for, for a delay analysis. So th that maybe just in addition was some of the talk. Okay, Mark? Yeah, uh, just to uh, add on to that. Um, since our charge was surveillance, um, we, we took that in, in a very broad sense, and this relates to 
the comments I made at work group one, is that uh, it was clear that the criteria that would be used for an active surveillance, an early warning system, would look different than um, a back end where you want really, so it's really, you want high sensitivity and you can sacrifice some, sensitivity, uh, some specificity if you're doing an active surveillance program, but for that retrospective um, you know, research to learn more about it, then you really want to emphasize the specificity. And so um, one of the keys of defining sort of the minimum data elements for case definition would be to reflect that those elements may be different depending on whether you're in an active surveillance mode versus more of a study research mode. And so uh, the uh, ability to reconcile both of those perspectives and develop tools that would support both of those perspectives was important. And I just wanted to quickly add to what Maya said in terms of getting, uh, having the ability of obtaining additional um, sample from patients. Is we talked about yesterday about um, in some of these databases there are patients with bio, there are biospecimens available, but when. When we're talking about SJS and TN, even if we can identify these cases reliable, re reliably and retrospectively in these databases, it may not be, they may not be the ones that have the biospecimens available. So there's still a lot of p patients without these specimens available. So the ability to go back and be able to, to obtain these additional um, samples in these patients becomes very important in these rare diseases. Any questions or feedback from people who weren't in that particular working group? 